Now, you're talking obviously about you know industry in effect and manufacturing industries. Uh, you did touch on education, though, yeah. But um, the, if you think about the, the public service, the civil service and public service, um, we're always talking about how complex our organisations are. Uh, I mean, the subjects of efficiency and effectiveness are not new. Uh, we have an endless numbers of initiatives and strategies for dealing with these things. So what's new here, I mean, other than the retrospective, other than sort of bagging it all up? Well, come on, Bob. What was the, where's the, the initiative that you can point me to on reliability in management teams uh, in the civil service over the last 20 years? Uh, you know, where's the example? Efficiencies, yes. I mean, I do. I, I would uh, agree with you there, and I think that's where the primary effort has has been, and that's understandable. It's been on efficiency gain, and particularly efficiency gain through cost reduction. Now, I think what I'm saying here is that first of all, let's focus on the management team mm -hmm. rather than uh, operations strategy and applications engineering, which right. is where many initiatives have been, quite rightly, in, in the public sector. Let's look at the management structures, the management team, the leadership styles, and the priorities that you find in there. So I think that's one distinct dif difference. But let's understand then that creating organisational reliability, high reliability in organisations, ensuring a prioritisation of delivering mission in the medium term is absolutely central to everything that we do, is not at 180 degrees in the opposite direction to gaining efficiencies. No, sure. It's a complementary activity to yeah. that. So not and I don't see that having been done in, no. in uh, the civil service. And I think if you're fair, you'd probably say the same. No, I think, I think it's, a, it's a reasonable comment. Now, so for you, then, if you were to try and sort of encapsulate the key lessons that the public service should draw from the research that you've seen, what, what, would, you, what would you say? Well, I think the, uh, the public services can learn a lot from uh, the Toyotas of, the, uh, of this world. Uh, I think the creation of information-rich environments uh, I've uh, sp already spoken about, uh, coordinated activity across the piece and relating heedfully across the management team to the central mission of the organisation, the central purpose of the organisation, uh, is a crucial par uh, part of it. Uh, creating zero-tolerance uh, management attitudes to stop cascading error, to, uh, as they say in the literature, uh, avoid, entrap or mitigate errors being allowed to cascade through the system. Um, I guess th they'd be some of the most important messages that I think can be taken and applied into the public services. On the point about zero tolerance, um, is that in a sense slightly at odds with the idea that we're being encouraged increasingly through uh, learning and development to, to take risks and uh, to, to build a no-blame culture in our organisations? I don't think so. I think um, the one thing, I mean another principle I, I uh, would, would uh, think could be picked up um, is the principle of learning trial without error. Now I think you can take risks if you want to be a high reliability organisation uh, and not make mistakes, you don't do that in core operations. You actually do that offline. You, you use techniques like uh, scenario planning, uh, simulation, modelling, these kinds of techniques that enable you to learn about uh, better ways of doing things. And you can take as many risks as you like there offline. But when we're doing it for real, then the thing has to work uh, with standard operating procedures uh, and it has to be, it has to deliver, well as the advert says, exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, otherwise we've got failure in the system mm. and, and we want to mitigate against that as much as possible and so do the general public. Yeah. Increasingly though learning methodologies are encouraging uh, people to actually use real life projects that, they're, that, are, that are live um, and actually work those through. So the idea of actually separating learning out into some sort of artificial capsule seems to be arguing against some of the leading edge learning philosophies. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the, uh, what, what I would argue is that you are um, operating those learning strategies real life, but not on the line with the general public. Um, and uh, it's just as much part of your job. It's, it's part of what you do 24-7, not 24-7, but certainly N7-365, mm -hmm. um, and therefore absolutely vital and important, but should not be allowed to impact the actual interactions with the public and the service that you are there to provide. You're taking risks as soon as you do. The holes in the cheese are starting to, will start to appear, and when the holes in the cheese line up, we know where that leads. Now, um, you know, you, if you were Oh, I, I can say that just as a, a management theorist and a, an organisation development specialist. Um, 
that is the risk that you will run in those situations if you do it that way. Okay, interesting. Now, Gus O'Donnell's vision is for a civil service that exudes pride, passion, pace and professionalism. Yes. I was reading those just in case yeah. I, I, I missed one. But uh, do you have any tips for Gus on how to drive this culture change through the civil service? Is it essential that uh, whatever I say starts with a P? Yeah. <laughs> it would help, actually, if it could be a line. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I'm a huge uh, admirer of, uh, of Gus and what he's trying to do with the civil service, and, and clearly they, they are very, very important uh, ideas and concepts. Um, it's interesting. I mean, in, in my uh, role at the university at Cranfield uh, the other day, I was uh, looking at a piece of research on uh, high-performing organisations which, was, um, which went on in, uh, in 1967, as far back as that. And um, the conclusions from that piece of work were, that, were that three things were important in any high-performing organisation. Um, time, feeling and focus. What the researchers found was that uh, in high-performing organisations, people spend a heck of a lot of time working on uh, the organisation and its problems. They, they are workaholics, so that is true. Mm -hmm. um, they do uh, care greatly about what they, uh, the, the organisation delivers. So there is that passion uh, element to, too. But they do de delimit uh, the area of their operations. I mean, the old adage um, from psychology, uh, from David McClellan's work, that high performers set moderate targets, uh, is, it seems to spring to mind straight away. Focusing onto a limited range a fairly simple and straightforward targets is one way of improving uh, performance. And passion, pace, and professionalism are not quite lined up with those, but they're not far off, actually, mm -hmm. in terms of, um, uh, of delivering. I think what they don't do, uh, those three words, uh, is focus on what I think are three more key um, overall strategic imperatives. Beginning with P? No, not beginning with P this time, Bob, no. Um, but I think what's important for any organisation is that it should be efficient, and efficiencies are really, really important, uh, that it should uh, be concerned with reliability, and the de I keep saying the deliver delivery of its mission in the medium term, and nothing must get in the way of that. If you're in the health service, then you must deliver health care. If you're in education, you must deliver to your students. And there isn't anyone I know in the public services who, who doesn't feel passionately about that and wouldn't want to do that. Mm. But efficiency and reliability, and, and that takes us back to our early discussion about those two being... Uh, the, the, um, uh, not, uh, not orthogonally uh, related. And then there's the issue of, of managing the change agenda and the change agenda being uh, set and delivering performance improvement uh, into uh, whichever aspects of the civil service that happens to be uh, and then review that agenda and change it and keep the change moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so those three are th uh, three other uh, important uh, categories that I think really are complementary to Gus's ideas on, on passion, pace and professionalism. And then you ask the question, well, how do you get that implemented? Um, and of course, that's the old change management problem. Um, if we move around the deck chairs, if we rearrange the offices, if we structurally realign and do all the things that we're all used to that uh, drive us crazy with overload in change management, then yes, you'll get some performance improvement. We can change our values. We can say, well, these are the things that we really think we should be prioritising and believing in and we'll try to behave in accordance with them. But again, that can sometimes deteriorate to no more than a chart on a wall mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. or a, an email sent round every now and again. The real way to implement is to change the way people behave, to change their taken-for-granted assumptions about this organisation and the way it operates. The sorts of things that, um, how could one say, uh, what makes for a good leader in this organisation? What makes for a good follower? How do we make decisions? How is authority allocated? How do we make um, decisions? What about communication patterns? Uh, it's very rare that these sorts of things are, are, are up for grabs, except in periods of rapid change. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the way to really implement, to identify these things and to make significant and deep-rooted changes in the way we operate the whole organisation around here for everyone for the leaders of the organisation and also for every member of the organisation. And collectively, we stand a chance of actually moving it in the right direction. David Tranfield, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.